Good morning. Wasn't that wonderful the way the choir started us out this morning? I just thought that was great and, and uh, was happy to hear <clears throat> those wonderful voices. And I'm going to, on behalf of them, speak this into you. If you're one of those voices that said, you know, I'd like to be in a choir too, then this is for you. They meet uh, at 6.15 to 6.30 or so to 8 on, on Wednesday night. You start at 6.30 now or 6, 6.30. Um, so come on up to the choir room uh, in uh, the new annex right above the main entryway. They'd love to have you uh, join them. Um, it has been a little bit of an arresting morning. I want to tell you this. So if it happens right at the second point in my sermon in the previous service, the fire alarms went off. But it's still here, so no one was harmed, and darn. Um, Just kidding. Um, So just be aware of that. Pastor Keith, um, you know, six years ago, a little bit over six years ago, we began to begin a spiritual journey with Pastor Keith that brought him to be part of our leadership team here, to preach many times, to be part of our our youth ministry and all of you that have been part of our, our Marian Methodist uh, community over those years or parts of those years have known that today's his uh, last day. He's actually downstairs with the 745 service and the folks thereof. And I invite you to come down and after church and uh, after this worship service and bless him and be with him for a few moments. Pat him on the back. I hope maybe you have something wonderful to say. And then um, uh, there's cake down there and so if you want to put some in this hair, it's all right. Um, get in a new church anyway. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Don't put it in his hair unless you have to. Um, two other things before we go uh, into the sermon. Um, there might be a few students towards the end of this service that leave. Don't think they're being rude. They're in my confirmation class. They have a picture upstairs at 930. And uh, I'll be joining them directly then. So if you see a few high school or junior high or high school kids leave, uh, they're not being rude. They just are doing what they're supposed to be. So uh, just depends on how long Pastor Mike goes on. And a moment of prayer. Vicki mentioned it in her prayer life, but at our previous service, I, I was handed a card of a, from a family that, uh, you know, it's always important to put names and faces on the things we pray for. I was handed a card from one of our families that attends that service that reminded us how connected our life is. Uh, they are part of the Rockport United Methodist Church in Rockport, Texas, which was completely demolished on Friday uh, afternoon. And so, of course, they've asked their prayers for their winter church home. And we pray for not only properties, but more importantly, people and souls. So if you would, if, you, if you'd allow me, if you'd take an attitude of prayer, let's join together. Uh, God, we, uh, we're in a city that's been devastated by weather before. Uh, we were blessed, Lord, in, in the last weather development here that no lives were lost, no, no bodies uh, perished. And yet we know in this big, wide swath of nature that is hitting uh, southeast Texas and other parts of the Gulf Coast that there are lives that are being lost. There's much damage mentally, spiritually, emotionally, as well as physically going on. And so we just pray. Uh, We pray while it's happening. We know there's still a lot of rain to come. Uh, We know that there's a lot of people that have, uh, in human terms, lost everything. And we know, of course, if they haven't lost you, Lord, they haven't lost everything. Um, So we we pray, Lord, that you might uh, rush with your angels, uh, with your arms of mercy and comfort, and uh, wrap yourself around those uh, that are part of uh, those communities that are being harmed. Uh, by this storm. We pray this in your name. We pray without apologies and we pray with greatest expectations. In Jesus' name, amen. These last uh, few weeks and the next few, we are walking through a sermon series on prayer, mostly based on uh, questions you've been asked. And unlike, if you're new with us, unlike uh, what seems to be our typical nature, where we'll read a specific scripture and then um, exhort from that, there will be a, quite a number of scriptures in, in our sermon series, uh, in the midst of the sermon, uh, and they would be disjointed, I think, if we read them one right after another. So, so please bear with us on that. But, but the question that came to me some time ago that helped form this sermon, or at least the, the germinal idea for this sermon, was what, 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 what is an attitude of prayer? What is an attitude of prayer? 
It always seemed to me when I was younger and maybe sitting in those pews or other ones or at a youth retreat and someone would come to the front, usually an adult, and say, now please everyone, get in an attitude of prayer. It always seemed that they were saying something that was so weighty, that instruction seemed so heavy and it didn't seem to matter what I was doing, that the command was something to do with being more serious, more reverent, more quiet, than what I was doing before I was asked that. And there was this command when when someone, an adult, typically would say, please take an attitude of prayer, that there was some sort of posture I was supposed to get in, some sort of thing that I wasn't doing at the time, and maybe you've felt the same way. And, And even sometimes, and some of us that are from old time churches, remember how language would transform. And even voices would transform when someone would pray. They'd be saying, okay, get an attitude of prayer. And then they say, oh, dear God, Lord, thou knowest, thou bestoweth, thou... All that kind of thing. And so the attitude of prayer seemed so heavy to me when, when someone would say that. Because it felt like, now, we're going to pray, and you need to get everything right for this. You need to get everything right. You, you better act right. You better be sitting right. You better be looking in the right place. But as I became an adult, I understand something. I missed the point. I missed the point of what someone was saying when they say, now please get in an attitude of prayer. What they were saying is that prayer is not so much an act as it is an attitude. The, the prayers, it, it is something that we do, but the attitude is what takes us there. See, because prayer is not a religious exercise. Prayer is, is simply communicating with God. And communication is an attitude, not an act. I mean, we say things in an act, but it's the attitude in which we go into communication that makes the difference. Let me give you an example. One 18-year-old girl, I know her personally. This, this story happens two weeks apart. She's enjoying the last few weeks of summer at home, in her own home. Her mother walks through the kitchen. It's the night before garbage day. And she says in this tone, Honey, will you please take out the trash? Tomorrow's garbage day. Mom, why are you yelling at me? Have you been in that conversation? Not saying I have, but I've heard it. <laughs> same child, same mother, two weeks later, but one week after she moved into her dormitory. Telephone call and speaker phone. Mommy, I miss you so much. Both words were being spoken from the same mouth. But the attitude that was taken into the communication completely transformed the act, wouldn't you say? Communication, prayer, is, is, is not so much an act, it's an attitude. And the attitude in which we pray, the attitude that we, that we take into prayer, the attitude that comes before our actual praying, determines the effectiveness of our communication with God. So, see, what, what, what I want to make sure you hear is that the attitude... It is determined or decided before the act. And the act is completely determined by the attitude. Did you follow that? The attitude makes a difference. And attitudes or an attitude of prayer are very beneficial to your prayer life. And I just want to look at five attitudes today. There's probably more. Some of you are are, are greater readers or greater thought thinkers than I am. But I want to share five attitudes. When, When I say... Please be in an attitude of prayer. When when I say that, when I say please be in an attitude of prayer, I hope that these attitudes happen in you. First one is pure motives. Pure motives are hard to find, aren't they? A couple weeks ago, I was on vacation. I was in Durango, Colorado. We were driving down. We'd had a fairly nice dinner. We're driving down the street. I've got my youngest daughter, her husband, my spouse, Teresa, with us, of course. We're driving down Main Street, and I come by what's called the cream bean. And right below it, it says Durango's number one ice cream store. And I drove about a block past it, and I looked at Teresa. I says, you know, I think Kirby wants an ice cream cone. 
Not really. Do you think it was Kirby that wanted an ice cream? So I noticed he ate one, but, but my motives weren't pure. But I knew if I bought an ice cream cone for my son-in-law, certainly I could have one. Right? Pure motives are hard to come to. And, and when we pray... We have to seek to have pure motives because when we pray, are we really praying to have our personal world made to our order? Is is that our motive? Is that what we're all about? What's the right motivation for prayer? It's right there in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. Our purpose is to please God. Underline, highlight. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He, God, alone is examines the motives of our hearts. See, God's interested in our motives even more than our actions. Our actions, of course, matter, but God knows why we do what we do and desires to reward those whose hearts are right with Him. This is the God who loves us. The right attitude when we go to prayer is one that continually surrenders every part of ourselves, every part of our heart, mind, soul, and strength to the control of the Holy Spirit That will purify our motives. My motives need to be purified. How about yours when I go to prayer sometimes? Uh, By the way, everybody should have said amen to that. Well, there's a couple of you that didn't need to, but the rest do. A second thing that when I, when I, as a pastor, when I go to pray, and I say, let's let's be in an attitude of prayer, that I hope one of your attitudes is just simply joy. You know, prayer is something that we're to go to with joy. And, and, and many Christians, maybe some of you in this room, feel the idea of joy in prayer is dissonant with what they were taught that prayer was about. It's, it's different. It's, it's discordant with what they were taught about prayer because prayer is such a serious matter. It's a weighty matter. When we say things to God, when we're in concert with God, we're saying things that are of eternal consequence. We're praying for people that might be hurting in their real lives. We might be praying for someone's soul. We might be praying for a relationship. We know they're, they're so heavy sometimes. And yet... Here that we're supposed to have an attitude of joy because the joy a Christian is to find and experience in prayer is in whom we're communicating with. It's not the what. It's the with whom we're communicating. Apologies to my English teachers. I think I got it right. Did I do okay, Sylvia? Amen. All right. She's been watching me since I'm 15, so. And she's always right. But you know this as a human being. That there are times when you'll meet someone, whether it's, you know, in Fairway or, or, or just in the church or somewhere else in the public, and you'll just see them. You haven't seen them for a while. And it's not that they're so perfect. It's not that they have so much to breathe into you. But, but you just say, it's good to talk to you. Have you said that to someone lately, either on the phone or when you met them? It's like, you, nothing, you know, like you get a call from your grandchild, your child or your friend. They, they didn't breathe any great thing into you. They just told you what the day at the lake was like or what happened at work. And at the end of the conversation, man, it's good to talk to you. It's not just good to talk. It's good to talk to you. And, and when we pray, our, our joy is in who we're speaking with, who, who we're having conversation with. It's because of our relationship. I mean, we're happy to talk to people because of our relationship with them. And when we talk to God, we're happy to talk to God. And we have joy in our heart, in our attitude, because we have relationship with Him. We have relationship with the Lord. Now, that doesn't prevent us from talking about weighty matters in either relationship. The people I'm happy to talk about, talk with, I don't have a hard time saying, hey, I've got something really heavy going on in my life, or difficult. And, And I can still say at the end of the conversation, man, I'm glad to have talked to you today. And and when we pray, we can have joy, but still speak to God about the heavy, weighty matters of our lives. Because we're talking to him in Acts 2 says this. You have shown me the way of life. And you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Too often. When we pray. We're basically relying on ourselves. You know, it's like the old story of the little child that says to his parents right before supper, can I be the one that gets to talk to the plate today? Right? 
Because too often we rely on ourselves in our prayer. We're, locked, we're relying on our own needs and our own misery. This is praying as if God doesn't exist. We're just talking to the air. We're just talking to a plate. We need to grasp joyfully the immense privilege that is ours when we get to talk to the creator, the sustainer, and the redeemer of the universe, our God, ourselves, anytime we want. I don't get that from Mediacom. I call them, they don't always want to talk to me. You know what? Our, our best friends, and you've had this, your best friends will sometimes silence you when you call them on the phone. You ever been in that? You were talking to somebody and their phone rings. I know, you all got phones in your pockets. And they look down at the phone and they look at you and they hit silence. Because you should say, you know, in your heart, you first say, darn, I'm important to this person. And then secondly, you say, well, that'll happen to me. We, we silence people. But God gives us his full, undivided attention. When we call, even though we don't give our full attention to him, even though we sometimes silence God in, in our lives, when we call, he's always there. He's always there to listen. Does not joy overwhelm your soul? When, when, you, when you consider the grandeur and the glory and the majesty of the one to which you get to speak, and joy should be the attitude of our soul when, 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 in our prayers when we remember all the great things that God has given to us. When we see the opportunity for, mystery, for ministry and the challenges that God puts before us and all the good things that are come to come in our lives. I, I always think that joy is a part of my prayers because in the midst of my worst times and I've been in prayer and I can speak of one Specifically, years ago, before I became your pastor, I was a pastor elsewhere. And I was having a really, really difficult time. Just stuff in the church. People, people's, sometimes the pain of our people really weighs a pastor down. I just want to tell you that. But there were some other things that weren't working out. And so I was really heavy. And I went to this prayer meeting with a handful of my friends. It was in the Boone Methodist Church. And I remember um, being about 20, 30 minutes into the prayer time. And God allowed me to laugh. Not at something anyone said, but the Holy Spirit kind of overcame my spirit and allowed me to laugh, just to laugh, not uncontrollably, not weirdly, but just to laugh. And I thought, in the midst of all this difficulty, that's what the joy of the Lord is. In the midst of whatever it was that was weighing on me at that moment, God was giving me pure, unadulterated joy and let my spirit, and he wouldn't even let me hold it back. He just said, listen, listen, Mike, there's joy in our relationship. Let it out a little bit. When we have pure joy, we can think about God's promises. We can understand that our success is not based on our performance, but on God's promises and faithfulness. When we pray in joy, we're freed for a life that, that, that's in relationship with Jesus because God has everything under control. A, a third attitude to go alongside motive and joy to have in prayer is confidence what does it mean to pray with confidence and maybe I should ask you directly do you pray with confidence in in Ephesians chapter 3 it says this in him and through faith okay those two things go together in him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. We get to go to God with confidence. Base your confidence on the receiver, not the result. We're a result-based group. I know we are. We're North Americans. We love results. But in prayer, our confidence is in the one who has, who, who, who hears our prayers. Haven't you said to another person at one time or another, when they're supposed to do something, they're going to say something, and you say, well, I have confidence in you, before they've done it? I have. I say that to your church staff all the time. They say, hey, we're going to do this. I say, well, I have confidence in you. How much greater is our confidence in God? Not based on the results that might come to us, but we say, I have confidence in you. It really comes down to a simple question. Do you trust God or not? I went to a prayer session a number of years ago. It was a prayer thing for preachers. We, we need to learn how to pray better. It was an all-day thing down at uh, what's now the Double Tree. And there was this guy from Branson, Missouri, and all the way through his four hours of talk, 
He kept saying this thing. In prayer, you need to be the fuse. In prayer, you need to be the fuse. In prayer, you need to be the fuse. And I'm like, well, that is what? I I didn't get it. Four hours into it. This is how he finishes. You got to drop the doubt, light the fuse, and understand the dynamite's on the other side. See, we're not the answer of our own prayers. We're the fuse that lights the dynamic power of God into that which we pray for. You understand? You got to be the fuse. I've carried that with me for a while. When I lean down and I get into my prayer posture, I say, God, light it up. I want it to go. The fourth thing that I think of when I say, let's be in an attitude prayer of, is expectation. This this I, I tell you a story. This week I had this great privilege. It's paired with another privilege. I, I've had the privilege now of being your pastor for a little bit over 14 years, which, uh, for good or bad, that makes me the longest tenured pastor in the history of the church. Uh, which means for some of you, wow, this isn't going to change. Or the others of you <laughs> say, yay. But it also means for me is I've lived in the same house for 14 years and stuff is playing out. So I don't know what my daughter's been doing back there in the bedroom for the bathroom for so many years, but their exhaust fan played out. None of the other ones did. I don't know if it's a combination of hairspray and uh, I don't know what they do back in there. But but the exhaust fan just played out. So I need an exhaust fan. Guys, some of you women, you've done this too. So an exhaust fan is a pretty simplistic thing to change. You take the old one out, you unhook it, you drop it, throw it in the trash. Go out somewhere where you can buy an exhaust fan, do that. I did all that. Had to make the hole a little bit bigger because I want this one to have a light in it. But that's not really part of the story. Just telling you I actually know how to do stuff. But I live in a ranch home. And yet the bathroom to where this fan is is way over at that end. And my hatch to my, uh, up into the attics at this end of the house. So I've got to go from one end to the other. So, you know, being, uh, trying to be prepared, drug lights up there, drug my tools up there, had everything ready, took the new exhaust fan up there because you had to drop it in and then screw it in to the thing. And I do all that, install it. Teresa's helped me down below. I, I hooked the wiring up. Now, fellas, <clears throat> ladies, this is not hard wiring. Black to black, white to white ground. Black to black, white to white, ground. Hook it all up. And I'm old school, so I said, all right, take the tape off the light switch, flip it on. Nothing. Not one thing. Now, at this point, I'm in an attic in Iowa in August. I got sweat drips coming off the bill of my hat. That's how uncomfortable I am. Plus, I don't know if your attic is clean But mine's got that blown-in insulation, so it's a bit dusty up there. So I think to myself, self, you did something wrong. Because what did I expect out of this fan? Black to black, white to white, switch the fan, right? So I take it all apart. I wire it again. Same wires back together. In the meantime, T runs downstairs, sees if I had flipped a breaker or something, had not. Black to black, white to white, flip the switch. Now it doesn't work. And I'm thinking some of the words some of you guys use sometimes. (laughs) So you know, all right. So I climb back down, I go downstairs and I say, all right. I'm going to clip this wire off of here. I clipped the two wires out. I bypassed the switch that had probably been made illegally in some foreign country. And I hooked it. Well, I I hooked it up to electricity. I'm going to say that. I'm going to tell you how. And the fan goes on. So all this because of one broken little part. And fortunately, Pastor Mike knows enough about electricity that I was able to wire it up. And it all works. Yay. But that's not the important part. The important part was, when I bought it, I expected it to work. When I pray, I expect it to work. I have high expectations because it's never broken like a little $7 switch can be broken. Do you have high expectations when you pray? And specifically, when you pray, do you expect anything at all? 
Or are you just talking to a plate? David the king in Psalm 5 verse 3 says this, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. Doesn't say he just sits around. Doesn't say, well, I prayed now. I hope for the best. I wait expectantly for your work and will to be done. David's prayers were expectant. He laid out his expectations to God. He laid his prayers to God and he expected something to happen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he prayed to, to the Father, he expected God to answer. And he taught his disciples, and that's you and me, to do the same. That's why it says in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe. Believe you have received them. Believe you received them before they happen. Believe you have received them and you will have them. Pray with this single-minded expectation. And so in addition, with, with the five attitudes, I'm going to quickly rattle through five things that you can do to help develop your expectation when you pray. If you're going to write, write fast. Number one, spend time in the Word of God. You have it available to you all the time. You can take one in the pews if you don't have one already. You can download the U version, etc. Number two, remember that God is a good God who gives good things to those who ask. He doesn't try to trick us. He doesn't try to hurt us. Third, get to know Jesus more. In a Christian world, that's a kind of a duh. Get, get to know Jesus more. Knowing Him will help you know His purposes and desires and allow you to know that He only wants the best for you. And give thanks to God when you pray. Thank God before and as you're receiving. And fifth, do not waver between faith and doubt. Hear me on that one, Christians. Do not waver between faith and doubt. Press into God and your doubts will flee and your faith will grow. But you've got to get in an attitude of prayer and expectation within that prayer for this to happen. Number five, I'll take you... To Pastor Keith's reception with this. When I say, or when others say, get an attitude of prayer, one of the things that you must be, or must have, is persistence in your prayer. Persistence in your prayer. Luke chapter 18, Jesus says this. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Never, ever, ever give up. Cry out day and night. We cannot lose heart in our waiting. We can't just throw up our hands and walk away from God. I I saw a throw up their hand and walk away about three weeks ago. I was uh, driving to a meeting, and it was one of those things where it was ill time. So it was a meeting at lunchtime, but they had promised not to have lunch for us. Okay? Some of you go to those meetings. You know, I'm a church, we're a church organization. We don't have a lot of cash and expense accounts. So I run into Jimmy John's, I think in Altoona. And yeah, Jimmy John's, just a sandwich place. Don't know if you've ever been there. But I get there 32 seconds before, I don't know what team it was, but it was the entire team from West Marshall High School. And they all came in and they stuffed that waiting room like that. And we're just, you know, they're all figuring because they know what number they want and all that kind of stuff. But as I get my sandwich, I turn, and the waiting room is full, because Jimmy John's are usually not big. I mean, it's packed with these kids, and they're being respectful and all that, just kids. But I walk, I saw this guy drive up, he had his family with him, he drove up, he gets out of the car, and he sees all these bodies in their school colors, and he just goes, (sighs) and just gets back in his car and drives off. Uh, he wasn't waiting for nothing. He wasn't going to be persistent for those sandwiches. I figured his kids just had to eat saltines that night, and they were probably fine. I don't know. I just don't know what happened to them all. But we know how we don't like to wait. We don't like to be persistent. But I want to tell you this. Because it's happened to everyone that's prayed. We have had a prayer that we said that was not answered. And what do you do with unanswered prayers? I want to step right into that faithfully and say this. That unanswered prayers test our faith they do and we meet the test and we pass the test when we keep praying and don't lose heart in spite of our frustrations in spite of our disappointments in spite of what we seem to feel as a silence on the other side of our prayers why do we need to keep asking God it seems like we're just nagging 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 God Well, remind yourself that what Jesus says when he says, 
pray and never give up, that the persistence in prayer is not for God's sake, it's for our sake. It's not so that he'll hear us better, it's that we'll pray more fully and richly. If we always got what we wanted, if I always got what I wanted, I'm pretty sure I'd start treating God like a genie. Wouldn't you? God's just going to grant me my wishes. But that, that's not what God is. That's not what he desires for us. And persistence, praying for something, when we've been in something, or somebody we know has been in something for a long time, it helps purge our desires and allows them to be transformed to, to whatever God's desire for us is. Because persistence demands patience. You just have to be. To get good in prayer, we've got to be persistent. Because persistence is the ground of spiritual growth. Doing the same thing. Leaning into God, leaning into God, leaning into God. I remember when Mike Wallace uh, interviewed Mother Teresa, Teresa of Calcutta. And he says, well, what's prayer like? He says, when you pray, you just lean into God. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand anything. So our persistence is, we just keep leaning into God. Regardless. Of results because of who we're talking to. And prayer calls us to, to, to a simple question. What do you really want? And the persistence in our prayers. Compels us to the true, cent- true center of prayer. Which is not something but someone. See the center of prayer is not something that we want. Or something that you want. Or something that you desire. But it's someone. And that is God our Savior. And that deepens our relationship with God. And ask us the question, do we want God the most? Above all things, do we want God? Persistence does not guarantee that you'll get what you want. It doesn't get, hasn't guaranteed me that I get what I want. But it does promise us something better. And that is relationship. Time with God. And the certain answer from Him that's His answer. So lastly, I want you to look at this quote from Forsyth. The chief failure of prayer is in its cessation. That means the failure of prayer is when it stops. That's when we fail in prayer, is when we stop praying. So that's how, or at least a primer from me, on how to pray. Next week we're going to take a look at at what do I pray for, which is another question that's come to us uh, from you. Um, Going to offer you some biblical counsel and... Interestingly enough, I'm going to give you a little bit of a get started kit next week. So I look forward uh, to having you come back and and, uh, drinking in uh, God's word next week. Let's pray. God, help me to pray. Amen. A couple of things coming up a week from Wednesday on September 6th. This will be the Wednesday after Labor Day weekend. Our powerhouse program will start that evening, which will include our evening meal, the children's programming, adult classes. Everything will begin on that evening. So take a look at some of the information that you've gotten in your bulletins and the newsletter and online to see where some places are might, that you could fit into and some things that you might want to take advantage of. And that will all begin, as I said, on September 6th. And that will also signal the moment or the time in which the 412 ministry will return to the sanctuary. They've been gathering all summer at Thomas Park, and so there won't be any interruption in their schedule other than the fact that they'll be back here on that evening rather than in the park. And there's going to be a little bit of a change of schedule for them as the junior high will meet from 6.30 to 7.30 here in the sanctuary and then senior high from 7.30 to 9. And then finally, um, fall Sunday school, as, as Luann mentioned earlier, Officially, we'll start on September 10th, which will be that last that next Sunday. So as you go today, remember all those things that Mike has shared with us this morning. And uh, may your prayer lives be enriched by all of that and just find new dimensions as you go to your Lord in prayer. Go with him and, and God bless you all. Thank you.